Boa noite, bem-vindas, bem-vindos ao Museu Judaico de São Paulo. É uma alegria enorme para a gente abrir o segundo Flimuji, Festival Literário do Museu Judaico de São Paulo. Eu sou Felipe Arruda, diretor do museu. Queria agradecer muito a presença de vocês é, e dizer que o museu só faz sentido com as pessoas, para as pessoas. Então, muitíssimo obrigado por esse encontro aqui dessa noite. Queria convidar já quem está de pé para já ir sentando, por favor, para a gente poder começar já já. E antes da gente começar, queria compartilhar com vocês algumas palavras sobre o festival. O Flimuji é, antes de um festival de literatura judaica, um festival judaico de literatura. Judaico por contemplar temas que são caros aos judeus, como memória e identidade, focos deste ano. Judaico pela presença de diversos autores judeus e judias e pela expressão de valores judaicos, como a justiça social e a rutzpa. E judaico pela devoção à palavra, ao texto e ao livro. Como disseram Amos Oz e Fânia Oz Salzberg no livro Judeus e as Palavras, abre aspas, nós, judeus, somos antes de uma linhagem de sangue, uma linhagem de texto. Mas é um aspecto a se ressaltar sobre o que há de judaico neste festival. Este aspecto é o apreço profundo pelo diálogo. A longa tradição judaica de se fazer perguntas, de valorizar a fricção entre pontos de vista distintos, e de cultivar o debate como forma de alargar a compreensão do mundo. Por isso, um círculo. Por isso, uma arena. Por isso, ocupada por 30 autoras, autores e autores de origens, idades, gêneros, territórios e crenças diferentes, que podem nos ajudar a pensar sobre as inquietações do nosso tempo. Um tempo de guerras e de incerteza sobre o futuro. Por isso, um festival feito de perguntas. Durante quatro dias, buscaremos nos afastar da velocidade excessiva, da histeria e das posições imediatistas e refletidas, e às vezes raivosas, que ocupam boa parte das redes sociais, na tentativa de construirmos juntos um outro fórum, mais qualificado, respeitoso, responsável. Essa arena formada de palco e de plateia, esperamos dirá não à simplificação das coisas, dirá não às certezas absolutas e às posições monolíticas, Perdão. dirá não à lacração e aos cancelamentos, dirá não à redução do mundo a um esquema binário, como se tudo fosse um grande jogo entre dois times, no qual aderimos cegamente à nossa torcida, sem nunca experimentar um outro lugar essas coisas que nos separam. Essa arena, esperamos, dirá sim à complexidade da vida, dirá sim à escuta verdadeira, à análise das nuances, à aceitação das contradições, à disposição de repensar as próprias verdades, dirá sim ao elogio da dúvida e, sobretudo, à celebração do outro como condição inalienável da nossa existência. Precisamos avançar nessa direção, a direção que nos aproxima. Nesses quatro dias, em 12 mesas de debate, vamos, de, vamos tratar de dois temas basilares da condição humana. Em primeiro lugar, a memória. Essa matéria, ao mesmo tempo individual e coletiva, real e ficcional, afetiva e histórica. Memória, essa coisa curva, turva, feita de corte. A memória aqui pode ser uma ilha, uma arma, uma armação ou uma armadilha. A memória pode ser aquela que guarda ou aquela que aguarda. Uma argamassa, uma farsa, a memória que disfarça. A memória que colhe, escolhe e encolhe. Ou a memória que é uma roça, um terreno arado, que é tão só uma lâmina de passado. Em segundo lugar, a identidade. As identidades. Expressões múltiplas, transitórias e contraditórias. A identidade, veremos, pode ser um traço, um retrato, uma força, mas também um risco. Assim como a memória, também uma invenção. A identidade pode ser uma pele, um nome, um chão. É sobre essa reflexão 
sobre memória e identidade, que se debruça a pergunta à mãe do festival. E se eu me esquecer de ti? Uma questão que aponta para o ato de lembrar e reconhecer o outro e também para o que é feito de mim quando do outro me esqueço. Não à toa, fazemos esse debate num museu, neste museu, um lugar de memória e de identidade. Imaginem por um minuto que estamos usando óculos que enxergam além das paredes, aqui dessa sala, com, como um raio-x. Ao olhar para cima, veríamos uma antiga sinagoga, palco de milhares de rezas, casamentos, bar mitzvahs, ritos judaicos, que aconteceram aqui desde 1932. Hoje, uma sala de exposição com objetos e documentos que expressam a memória milenar judaica. Logo abaixo dessa antiga sinagoga, enxergaríamos aqui mesmo, acima do teto, a história de 500 anos da presença judaica no Brasil, com seus inúmeros capítulos e entrelaçamentos com a vida brasileira. Memória do povo judeu nesse território, elaboração contínua de sua identidade. E se olhássemos para baixo, aqui exatamente embaixo dessa sala, veríamos um grande tesouro, o maior acervo judaico brasileiro, abaixo de nossos pés, com um milhão de páginas de documentos, cem mil fotografias, milhares de livros, cartas, mapas, enfim, que contam a memória da presença judaica aqui no Brasil. Então, literalmente, estamos aqui cobertos, envolvidos, soterrados e sustentados por infinitas camadas de memória, ao mesmo tempo que produzimos aqui, nesse tempo, agora, novas memórias. Como forma de tecer memórias antigas com novas memórias, inventadas, essa edição do Flimurge tem também uma exposição. A partir do nosso convite, a escritora Noemi Jaffe mergulhou no vasto acervo do museu, passando dias inteiros abrindo gavetas e mapotecas, manuseando documentos e objetos, se perguntando quem eram e o que fizeram cada uma daquelas pessoas. Ao emergir desse mergulho, Noemi trouxe à luz centenas de itens para contar uma história, a exposição, intitulada Rebeca, a costura do avesso, narra a história de Rebeca, uma mulher judia, que é tantas outras, que não só reveladas pelo acervo, mas, de algum modo, todas as mulheres judias. Quem sabe uma história comum a todos os judeus. A mostra integra o segundo Flimuge, então um festival literário que acontece num museu, que tem uma exposição, curada e escrita não por uma artista visual, mas por uma escritora, e que a gente está muito feliz. E vocês estão convidados e convidadas a conhecerem a exposição no mezanino aqui da, da sinagoga. Inclusive, a Noemi vai fazer uma visita com o público amanhã às 15 horas. Então, todos já super convidados. Bom, para finalizar, gostaria de agradecer em primeiro lugar aos 30 autores, autoras e autores, mediadores, mediadoras, que aceitaram o nosso convite. É uma honra ter vocês aqui no festival. Faço questão de agradecer também aos nossos valiosíssimos parceiros dessa edição, a Embaixada da França no Brasil, o Instituto Goethe, o Instituto Brasil Israel, a Casa Sueli Carneiro, a Livraria Megafauna, a 451, o Shopping Light e a Gazite. E a todos os mantenedores, patrocinadores, e apoiadores e patronos do museu. Um agradecimento muito especial aos nossos voluntários e à maravilhosa equipe que atua aqui com muita paixão aqui no museu. Muito obrigado. E a equipe também, que bota o festival de pé. Eu queria fazer dois agradecimentos assim bem especiais à Marília Neustein, diretora de comunicação do museu, à Mariana Lorenzi, que é coordenadora da área aqui de programação. Cadê a Mariana? <risos> Mariana. É, além além da, da Mari e da, da Marília, Pessoas fundamentais para o festival, Beatriz Costa, Débora Acerton, Isadora Witt, Gabriela Brás, Gabriele Brás, João Bonfim, Patrícia Bete e Roseli Vaz. Muito obrigado. E nossos colaboradores externos, a Agência Papel na Comunicação Visual, Estela Tenenbaum na Cenografia, Fernanda Carvalho na Iluminação e a Quatro Lofote na Assessoria de Imprensa. Bom, falei bastante, então, para acabar... Um agradecimento muito, muito especial dos nossos grandes parceiros nessa jornada, dessa segunda edição. Os curadores, a editora crítica literária e curadora Rita Palmeira, 
o cientista social Daniel Dweck. Uma dupla afinadíssima com que tivemos a honra enorme de colaborar num processo fluido, frutífero, sempre colaborativo. Muito obrigado por conceberem e organizarem as mesas do segundo Flimuge com tanto amor, rigor e inventividade. Bom, nosso mais carinhoso agradecimento a vocês e a palavra é de vocês. Bom festival a todos. Boa noite. A gente vai fazer um jogral aqui, que é uma picadoria a quatro mãos. Uh, vou tirar o Bom, boa noite a todas e todos. É uma alegria estarmos aqui reunidos para dar início à segunda edição do Flimuge. Foram sete meses de trabalho para chegar à programação que começa hoje. Estávamos sonhando um festival quando fomos todos atropelados pelo pesadelo do 7 de outubro e pela guerra que se seguiu dali. Não são tempos fáceis para fazer um festival, mas sabemos. Por outro lado, mais do que nunca, queríamos reunir pessoas de diferentes lugares e perspectivas e que se dispusessem a sentar e conversar. Mais do que nunca, essa é a hora de estarmos reunidos em diálogo. Nos próximos dias, por esta sala, passarão convidados de São Paulo, claro, mas também de Rondônia, do Rio Grande do Sul, de Minas Gerais, do Rio de Janeiro, da Bahia. Gente da Jamaica, dos Estados Unidos, de Israel, da Inglaterra, da França, da Alemanha. E todos e todas tomarão a cena para falar de si e de seus livros sem se esquecer do outro. A tradição judaica é repleta de referências sobre a importância da memória e o perigo do esquecimento. Para um povo diaspórico, vivendo em pequenas comunidades em meio a outras nações, a percepção de passado e destino comuns, calcada na memória, funda laços de solidariedade. Na perspectiva religiosa, a memória chega a constituir um mandamento. A obrigação de lembrar e a instrução para que não se esqueça aparecem na Bíblia hebraica inúmeras vezes. Ademais, contar e reencenar as histórias que não devem ser esquecidas é parte central dos rituais ao longo do ano. Lembrar talvez seja uma maneira de reter por outras vias aquilo que foi perdido. Zichrono Livrahá, de abençoada memória, ou que a sua memória seja uma bênção, é a maneira pela qual os judeus honram os mortos. E a lembrança da destruição do Templo de Jerusalém, por exemplo, que leva judeus a quebrarem um copo no dia do seu casamento e a deixarem parte de suas casas sem acabamento. Cito, o judaísmo é uma religião do tempo, visando a santificação do tempo, escreve Abraham Joshua Heschel. Um relicário, diz ele, que nem os romanos nem os alemães foram capazes de queimar. Entretanto, também de uma perspectiva secular, não se pode esquecer. Após a Shoah, lembrar o genocídio dos seis milhões de judeus tornou-se um imperativo ético. Nós lembramos, diz o slogan. Em Israel, o dia da memória, Yom Zikaron, celebrado em quatro de ar, às vésperas do dia da independência, rememora os soldados mortos e as vítimas do terrorismo. A segunda edição do Flimuge irá discutir os diversos usos que são feitos da noção de dever de memória. Se uma sociedade não existe sem o seu passado, desde suas tradições até o enfrentamento das chagas resultantes de projetos desumanos, a escravização, o extermínio ou o colonialismo de forma mais ampla, o indivíduo submetido a eventos traumáticos deve poder esquecer. O imperativo da memória, afinal, recai sobre as vítimas da violência ou sobre os seus algozes? Quem lembra e quem esquece? 
Se a memória é constitutiva dos indivíduos e das sociedades, o esquecimento parece ser privilégio dos autores de projetos de destruição. Das vítimas, espera-se equivocadamente que aprendam com o sofrimento, quando se sabe que a violência não pode jamais desempenhar a função pedagógica. Pensada sob a ótica das dores individuais, a memória pode ser uma condenação paralisante que leva à melancolia. Se não estiver atrelado ao trabalho de luto, como sustenta a psicanálise, o lembrar-se constante é sinônimo de sofrimento. Como pensar nessas questões sem perder de vista que estamos no Brasil, país violento em que as populações negras e indígenas foram submetidas à escravização e espoliação, resultado de um projeto colonial que deixa como herança uma sociedade desigual, racista e autoritária. Como refletir sobre isso dentro de um museu judaico que abriga a história de um povo milenarmente perseguido e vítima de um genocídio que, pelo horror, reorienta a história do século XX e que tem, no culto à memória, parte fundante da sua cultura? O exílio do povo judeu levou a promessa do profeta Jeremias. Se eu me esquecer de ti, ó Jerusalém, que minha mão direita perca sua destreza, que minha língua fique grudada em meu palato, se eu não me lembrar de ti. Mas ora, de que Jerusalém falava ele? A geografia da cidade? Suas muralhas? Seus reis? Ou os povos que ali viviam? Em Turistas, poema de Euda Mihai, não há dúvidas. O imperativo da memória é deslocado das ruínas históricas das edificações para as pessoas comuns. Estão vendo ali o arco da época romana? Não importa, mas do lado dele, um pouco à esquerda e abaixo dele, está sentado um homem que comprou frutas e verduras para sua casa. É nesse espírito reconhecendo o caráter arbitrário, sempre inacabado da memória, que exige um engajamento permanente em sua construção e percebendo que ela pode servir tanto à abertura à alteridade como ao ensimesmamento, buscaremos refletir as conexões entre memória e identidade. Porque se eu me esquecer de ti, o que será de ti? E o que será de mim? Todo o festival é resultado do trabalho de muitas pessoas e queríamos agradecer a todos os parceiros que nos apoiaram nessa jornada. Eles foram mencionados pelo Felipe e nos juntamos ao Felipe no nosso muito obrigado, muito obrigada. Queríamos agradecer especialmente a ele, Felipe Arruda, a Mariana Lorenzi e a Marília Neustein, que se desdobraram para dar condições para que o Flimuge acontecesse nos apoiando decisivamente. E também a Beatriz Costa, o Leonardo Moreira, a Débora Seton, a Patrícia Bete, a Roseli Vaz, a Gabriele Braz, a Isadora Vitti, ao João Bonfim e a toda a equipe do museu. A Estela Tenimbal, que é responsável por essa bela cenografia, a Fernanda Carvalho, que faz a iluminação, a equipe da Papel Estúdio, que cuidou da identidade visual, e a da A4, que fez a assessoria de imprensa. Queremos também agradecer as editoras parceiras, Uh, finalmente, nosso muito obrigado, nosso muito obrigada aos autores e às autoras, aos mediadores e às mediadoras que aceitaram o nosso convite para estar aqui. E a vocês do público que se dispuseram a escutar. Obrigada. E agora, sem mais delongas, a gente queria dar início a primeira mesa do Festival Literário do Museu Judaico, chamando ao palco Gisele Begelman, artista, professora da FAUSP, autora de Políticas da Imagem, Vigilância, Resistência e Resistência na Dadosfera e Memória da Amnésia, Políticas do Esquecimento, entre outros livros. Suas obras integram acervos de museu no Brasil e no exterior, em seus projetos recentes, inclusive aqui no Museu Judaico, investiga a construção do imaginário colonialista das artes e das ciências com recursos de inteligência artificial, que vai mediar a conversa 
com o nosso convidado, David Badiel, que veio de Londres pela primeira vez no Brasil lançar o livro Judeus Não Contam e que vai ser apresentado com mais detalhes pela Gisele. Por favor, Gisele e David. Yeah, I know you're going to speak in Portuguese. That won't freak me out. I'm, fi I'm fine with that. Yeah, I, yeah, it's Brazil. I understand. Yeah, exactly. Boa noite a todos, todas e todos. É uma honra, um privilégio estar aqui, não só no Museu Judaico, no Primus, mas encarregada de fazer a mediação desta mesa e do lançamento do livro do David Badeu no Brasil. É, o humorista David Badeu... Precisa começar de novo? O humorista David Badeu não acredita em Deus, mas gostaria muito que ele existisse. É, ele escreveu e atuou em uma série de programas de humor de grande sucesso na TV britânica e é autor de quatro romances e nove livros infantis que venderam mais de um milhão de cópias. O sucesso do seu livro, Judeus Não Contam, que é esse que está sendo lançado hoje aqui, que sai em português, foi tamanho que se transformou em um documentário com o mesmo título também para a TV. Nesse livro, o David Badeu questiona como o antissemitismo foi não só minimizado no debate antirracista, mas como ele chega, inclusive, a ser tolerado nos circuitos progressistas. Eu vou abrir essa conversa, primeiro passando a palavra ao David, que vai ler um trecho do livro para vocês, se necessário, tem tradução simultânea acontecendo. Ah, ok. Oh, I'm going to read. That's right. Ok. So, hi, everybody, first of all. Ok, don't, no, actually, I can't have Portuguese in my ears. No, no, you, no, no. Whoever's, whoever's translate... Ok, I'll take it off. No, you don't Whoever's like translating it. Portuguese, I can't talk while you're translating Portuguese in my ear, because that just makes me want to speak Portuguese, which I can't, and so that'll be weird. Okay, so I'll, I'll guess I'll put it back on my ear when questions are being asked. I don't know. Hello, everyone, again. Uh, yeah, I'm David. Uh, thanks for coming to see me talk, and uh, I'd like to thank the people who did the introduction for the longest introduction that I've ever had. That was... <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I nearly thought I might go back to London and come here again. Uh, but um, thank you to, uh, to the Jewish Museum for inviting me. That's also... Uh, I've not been to Brazil before, uh, and I'm in some power. Actually, this has nothing to do with the question, but I, 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 it's great here. It's really great to be here, except that every single person I meet says, oh, you mustn't go there. Whatever you do in São Paulo, don't go to that bit of São Paulo. Basically, the only place you're okay is on stage at the Jewish Museum. Everywhere else, you might get attacked. So, uh, but apart from that, it's been really lovely. Uh, in terms of this book, which I am here to talk about, even though I'd quite like to just do stand-up, um, it's, um, yeah, so the, the central premise Gisele has already outlined, which is, I'll just sort of talk about it before I read, which is that over the last sort of 20 years, it seems to me that, and by the way, I'm behind, you're behind me, so that, that's bad, hello, um, uh, is, it should really re revolve, uh, I think, <laughs> uh, that I, uh, I noticed that there'd been an intensification, uh, certainly in Britain and Europe and America, and I assume also in Brazil, of concern. Uh, about minorities and about discrimination of all sorts, not just ethnic minorities, all sorts. And that this is a good thing, right? This is a good thing. This is a correction to many, many years in which minorities had no inclusion or representation and there was very little concern about offense against minorities. This is a good thing, except I also noticed another thing about it, which is that Jews were low, very low, in the mix of that correction. It seems to me that Jews were not even really in that conversation a lot of the time. Uh, and this book 
gives you some examples of that happening, specifically examples how within what I would call the progressive conversation, the identity politics conversation, Jews are left out, and then it examines why. Why I think that happened. So I'm going to read you a bit. And because I'm in Brazil, I thought I'd read you the bit about football. Is that okay? Uh, as I'm just kind of excited to be in the same country that Pele and Jarzinho, uh, and not so much Neymar, uh, Kate, uh, comes from. Um, and so uh, I thought I'd read you that. And uh, there's a lot of swearing in this bit. It's a lot of swearing, and I apologize for that in advance. I'm kind of keen to know what the translation is, but I'll leave that. In 2008, I was sitting, as usual, on a Saturday afternoon with my brother Ivor, watching Chelsea FC at their home ground, Stamford Bridge. Uh, we'd been going for many years, and by this point, we sat in the Upper East Stand. Chelsea were playing another Premier League club, Aston Villa. The game was dull. On the big screen, a score came up of another match. Chelsea's London rivals, Tottenham Hotspur, were being beaten by a considerably less glamorous club, Hull. The board crowd picked up on this and started chanting, we hate Tottenham, and we hate Tottenham. Then, with wearying predictability, this mutated into the crowd chanting the word, Yiddo. For those who don't know about this phenomenon, the Tottenham Hotspur Football Club is located in an area of London that is fairly well populated by Jews. For this reason, Spurs fans both self-identify and are identified by others as a Jewish club, even though the vast majority of the fans are not Jewish, and this leads to various chants in the stadium based around the word Yid. Those who do know about it are still generally confused, as they think it's all just Spurs fans chanting this word positively. It isn't. It is also chanted by the fans of Chelsea, Arsenal, West Ham, and other football clubs at Spurs fans, menacingly, horribly, along with associated anti-Semitic chants. Spurs are on their way to Auschwitz, for example, and hissing to simulate the noise of gas chambers. On this particular afternoon, the chanting of the word Yiddo was joined by one particular fan about 10 rows behind us, deciding to shout repeatedly, fuck the fucking Yids, fuck the fucking Yids. And then just to make clear that by Yids, he didn't just mean Spurs fans, that became fuck the fucking Jews. Fuck the fucking Jews. This went on for some time. Me and Ivor, my brother, looked at each other. Ivor said, what should we do? I shrugged. So then my brother, bless him, got up, turned round, and told the bloke to shut up. The man replied in the classic mode, no, you fucking shut up. Ivor said, no, you fucking shut up. And then miraculously he did. The racist shut up. Ivor sat down and said, I think I'm going to cry. By the time this happened, we had sat listening to this stuff at Chelsea's ground for 30 years. Over that period, the culture around racism in football changed immeasurably. In the 1970s, football fandom in Britain was unbelievably racist, and immense strides were made to eradicate it over the next decades by organizations like Kick It Out. By 2008, the world had definitely moved on. So much so that the Chelsea program that day contained a very clear message that any racist abuse heard in the stands at matches would lead to immediate intervention by stewards and a life ban for the abuser concerned. Well, not any racist abuse, it turns out. No steward intervened when this happened, and no life ban was imposed on the man shouting, fuck the fucking Jews. The world had moved on, but it seems that it had forgotten something. It had left one racism behind. And the central point about that story, as with all the stories that I tell at the start of the book, is not that there was an anti-Semite, a racist, at a soccer match. There are always anti-Semites and racists everywhere, and certainly at soccer matches. But the point is that over the time I'd been going to football, gatekeepers had emerged who said, we're not having racists at football matches and we're going to close them down and we're going to put out educational information that stops them and we're going to record them on CCTV and those people are going to be called out and they're not going to be in your stands anymore. But as far as anti-Semitism goes, it's virtually invisible. 
It's literally invisible, actually. I Or inaudible would be a better metaphor. A friend of mine was at another club where the same thing happened. And he, he did go up to a steward and he said, can you hear these people shouting racism? And the steward just said, I can't hear any racism. So that's it. It's a type of racism that is not recognized as racism, often mistaken for religious intolerance, which I'm sure we'll come back to. And that is what the book is about. Thank you. Eu cheguei no seu livro. No, I've got to put this back. Oh, go, go, go back. Yeah. Listen to me now. Yeah, I'm listening. Okay. Eu cheguei no seu livro na época de um grande debate que se tornou quase que um escândalo e circundou a retirada de um trabalho absurdamente antissemita da última documenta de Cássio um trabalho de autoria do coletivo indonésio Tariq Padi. Eh, a obra chamava People's Justice, a Justiça do Povo. E tinha como um dos seus portes mais importantes um enorme mural em praça pública que retrata a resistência política por meio de centenas de figuras, quase que numa estética de cartoon. Dentre essas centenas de figuras, os judeus eram pintados de forma altamente ofensiva. Durante a minha leitura, apesar de você comentar diversas vivências antissemitas, como a que você introduziu agora no seu cotidiano, várias vezes eu me perguntei qual foi a situação pessoal que você viveu que levou a decisão de, bom, eu vou escrever um livro sobre isso. Um, so, um, it's interesting you mentioned a mural, actually, uh, because uh, I don't think you were, just in terms of the translation, I don't think you were talking about the mural in Britain, were you? You weren't talking about that, you're talking about a mural here? No. Just to be... No. Documenta de Castle. Right, so I so the last one of, document. So, so one of the things that uh, I talked about, which is a good example of uh, the, the the phenomenon and what happens, as a, or at least what's at the base of the phenomenon, is a mural in London, due to, uh, which I talk about in the book. So one of the things that the leader of the Labour Party, the leader of the left wing Labour Party in Britain, Jeremy Corbyn, who uh, was one of the catalysts for writing the book, not so much him himself, but the fact that I uh, there was an enormous sort of scandal and crisis around anti-Semitism, and anti-Semitism was suddenly something that was on the cover of British newspapers because there was an anti-Semitism issue on the left, on the Labour Party, and there were constantly accusations of it. One of the key accusations, it just happens to be also about a mural, uh, was that um, a, a, an artist called Mir One, uh, an American artist, had painted a mural in East London. And the mural was supposedly a very, very progressive uh, artistic statement. It was uh, poor people, brown and black poor people, uh, bending down. And above them, the rich white people are playing Monopoly. Do you have Monopoly here? Right, okay. Monopoly. Are playing, sorry. I mean, why would you not? Uh, but anyway, playing Monopoly on the backs of the world's poor. And that was in his own mind, and indeed in Jeremy Corbyn's mind, who supported the mural, just a statement against oppression. Unfortunately, if you look at the way these men were painted, they're clearly Jewish. I mean, they're clearly grotesquely and cartoonly Jewish. They, looks like, they look like something from Der Sturmer. They're all men with very hooked noses and beards, and they're grasping money in a very particular way. And actually then, when, when a few Jews complained, uh, Mir One, the artist, wrote an extraordinary, in my mind, anti-Semitic thing in that he said on Facebook, he said, oh, I see some rich, white, these are very, very important ways in which Jews are imagined, rich, white, Jewish folk are upset. Again, upset, even an interesting word, sort of not that they're calling out racism, that they're upset with their stupid, whiny sensitivities, with my portrayal of their beloved Rothschild and beloved Warburg, these names that if you click on them, which you can do on his post, you will be taken down into the worst conspiracy theories uh, on the internet about Jews. Uh, and... The key thing about that, and the reason, the issue with Jeremy Corbyn, uh, in his supporting uh, of the Mueller, and his, uh, he wrote a Facebook post opposing it being taken down, is that anti-Semitism is the only racism which can be reframed as punching up. 
That's the key thing. The key thing about Jews uh, is that they are the only minority, as far as I'm aware, certainly in the West, who are associated with power. So most minorities, Jews have a dual status. I say this in the book, but most uh, have a, uh, minorities are associated with racists with very low status things. So racists will imagine all minorities that they despise as lowly, as vile, stinking, thieving, whatever else. And Jews have that, but Jews have this other status, which is that they are powerful, privileged, and secretly in control of the world. And so when Mir One and indeed Jeremy Corbyn see that mural, what they see is a rebel yell. They see a revolutionary act. They see punching back against the man. And this carries on. This carries on when Kanye West says, I'm going to go DEFCON against all Jews. It carries on now when uh, Ai Weiwei right, has just like had his uh, exhibition postponed in London. And I just come now from seeing 1,300 people writing a letter saying that that was amongst many examples of Palestinian voices being suppressed. Now, I am perfectly fine totally fine for people to write a letter saying that Palestinian voices are being suppressed. Palestinian voices are being suppressed. Unfortunately, if you look at Aweiwei's statement, what he actually says is Jewish money controls the world. That's what he actually says in the statement. Jewish money controls everything in America. And, you know, that's, that's the central point of his message, right? And that's something that Hitler believed and something that everyone who is imagining that they're making revolutionary statements that attack Jews are actually making. Anyway, I haven't answered your question, which is why did I write this? Uh, this was the beginning, actually. Okay. Uh, but the end was when I was reading your book, many, many times I thought, what happened? What was the thing that happened? And you decided, wow, I cannot stand it anymore. Right. I will write a book. The thing about was this. what happened. The football thing is very important from that point of view because uh, I go to football every week. Uh, and so, I'd, and I'd listened to that for many years, uh, and I noticed uh, that it had become completely normalized. And the normalization of anti-Semitism is kind of extraordinary, the way that that happens. Uh, and I also noticed that when I decided, which was well before writing the book, that I tried to get something done about it, the particular people who would not listen were the gatekeepers of what you might call modern sort of leftist morality. So I went to, I mentioned in the book, this organization, Kick It Out. So Kick It Out, that's their job. Their job is we are an initiative to stop people being racist towards black players, but also to stop homophobia, to stop anyone saying terrible, anything terrible to disabled people, all the rest of it, that's their job. And they were not interested. They, they literally could not see that this was an issue. And what I'm talking about, by the way, which is something that I would say no other minority has, has to deal with, we're talking with 30,000 people, 40,000 people chanting a hate word for Jews, right? I mean, that, and that's something I normalized. That was something I just decided I would live with. And then suddenly I thought, why am I living with this? Eu vou continuar desse ponto. Okay, é, okay. Eu vou fazer uma série de perguntas, mas vocês também poderão encaminhar perguntas para o David e com ela, <risos> tá bom? É só chamá-la e ela traz um papelzinho para vocês. Eu vou continuar do ponto em que você parou, até porque é, os judeus são associados em geral à branquitude, especialmente no Brasil, onde aqui isso também se conjuga ao preconceito milenar do povo deicida. Nós matamos Jesus Cristo e, num, num país católico como o Brasil, isso tem um peso enorme. Mas, falando mais sobre a branquitude, que é algo mais restrito a um perfil intelectual progressista, eu... Tem uma teoria muito pessoal que a eugenia ela foi inventada por um inglês, pelo Francis Galton. É, não por acaso ele fez os primeiros... O, ele desenvolveu toda a metodologia, os testes com fotografias é, que ele fez centenas de vezes de garotos judeus de uma yeshiva em Londres. Né? Mas eu sempre me perguntei, sempre me convenci de uma forma muito especulativa que essa teoria só poderia 
ser desenvolvida nesse contexto porque ela permite livrar os europeus de um fantasma insuportável, que é os judeus europeus são brancos. E como eu vou é, lidar com esse branco que os brancos não toleram? É, no seu... No seu livro e também várias vezes no seu Twitter, que agora é X, você menciona a hashtag Jews not white, né? os judeus não são brancos. Num contexto como o brasileiro, eu acho que seria muito importante ouvi-lo falar disso, até porque esse argumento da branquitude, do meu ponto de vista, sempre foi uma maneira de fazer com que os brancos pudessem se livrar daquele branco que não é eles. Um, ok, so uh, there's a number of things to say about Jewish whiteness, about the concept of Jewish whiteness. Uh, the, the prime, so number one is there are many Jews of color. Uh, we have Lewis Gordon in the audience tonight. My niece is, is a Jewish person of color. So that's one of the first things is that Jews are imagined as part of the notion of the privileged Jew. That, and obviously whiteness is associated with privilege. That Jews are primarily imagined as, a, as white in one way or another. However, the phrase I use in the book is Schrodinger's Jews. Now, I don't know how many, how, if I have to go into trying to explain, which I will do badly, Schrodinger's cat. Uh, I, I'm going to give it a go, right? So Schrodinger's cat, in the physics analogy, is both alive and dead in the box, depending on which radioactive isotope is in the box. Let's not worry too much about it. But the point is that the analogy I use is that Jews are white or non-white, depending on the politics of the observer. By that, I mean that the far right, for centuries has dismissed Jews uh, as white, dismissed Jews from the category of whiteness. It's obvious that the Nazis uh, considered Jews to be not part of the Aryan white races uh, and uh, white supremacists in America presently, specifically within the, the various constitutions towards a new white America that white supremacists uh, imagine will someday happen, that Jews are not at all invited to that. Uh, it's part of a long tradition that Jews are, by, like Voltaire, considered Jews to be too Asiatic to live in a future Europe. There's a very long tradition of Jews being dismissed as white. But then on the other side, and this is the Schrodinger's part of it, I see many, uh, I mean, that Mir One thing is a good example. The first thing that Mir One reached for when he was angry with Jews for seeing anti-Semitism in his mural was to call them white. Because for a progressive, the way that you can exclude someone or a group from concern, from being someone who needs help, from being a vulnerable minority, is to, is to apply whiteness to them. And because Jews are associated with richness and privilege and all the other things that Jews are quickly associated with by mythologically by racists, that it's easy, therefore, to make that clear, and this is a progressive reflex, to imagine them as white. So in terms of the, the, the reality, Jews are many different shades or whatever, but the reality of a Jew, Jew's skin is not the point. The point is that I, the reason I say, that I have sometimes said hashtag Jews not white, is that I think whiteness should be seen really as a metaphor for safety that a white person in a white country feels most secure and most safe and least likely to be the object of racist attack. That's what whiteness means. Jews obviously cannot claim that status, or if they do claim it, it is fragile. And so the notion, which often happens, that Jews are speaking from a position of white privilege is never investigated by the people who don't understand that anxiety. É, especialmente no contexto dos últimos, é, especialmente nos últimos dois meses, quase dois meses, essa vulnerabilidade 
tem se mostrado muito mais acentuada. Mas antes de chegar nesse ponto sobre a guerra em si, é, um dos momentos mais hilários do seu livro, que tem vários, a gente está aqui falando de coisas super sérias, mas o livro tem momentos gozadíssimos, um dos momentos mais engraçados é quando você comenta as particularidades dos israelenses e num contexto, às vezes, de identidades forçadas que nós somos obrigados, de alguma forma, a assumir entre a, os judeus diaspóricos e Israel. E você lembra, no seu livro, é, lembrando até um personagem... É, Taxista. Well, I, talk, I think the bit you're referring to is a film, the film, my film, The Infidel, and in uh, it's about Lenny. Yes. One. So in the, so I wrote a film which I recommend you can see it. It's on uh, Not just Apple TV. Book. It's on Amazon. You can see it. It's called The Infidel. It's about a Muslim who discovers that he was biologically Jewish. Uh, and oh God, it's funny. Um, and in that film, the Muslim goes to his Jewish neighbor, who's an American, who's called Lenny, to try and find out about Jews. And that's one of the things about the complex humanity that I'm comically trying to do, is it takes him about two hours. I mean, not you don't see the whole two hours, but in a montage, he spends hours trying to explain there's this type of Jew and that type of Jew and another type of Jew. And right at the end of it, he says, and, and there's Israelis. And he says, Jews without angst, without guilt, so therefore not Jewish at all. Not Jews. Right, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and that, that is, by the way, how I see Israel. It's very, Israelis sometimes tell me that's unfair. There are some in this room, and they tell me that's unfair, which it probably is. Uh, but when I see the kind of Sabra ideal, I think, like, what kind of well, fucking Jew is that? Not right? I, yeah. like, uh, not at all Jewish from my point of view. Uh, but, I, but actually, that relates to another point, which you were probably... No, no, it was exactly this point. Uh, okay, but, about, but well, I think... But a lot of... One of the things about the book, if we are, is that I think... Uh, in terms of Israel, uh, I try and make it clear that I think the um, anti-Semitism is an extremely complex racism. It's, it, it has its own need to, def to be defined and deconstructed, uh, and it goes back centuries and centuries and centuries. And yet, one of the most common reflexes, certainly that I get and uh, other Jews will get, when they talk about anti-Semitism is just, what about Israel? What about Palestine? As if anti-Semitism begins in 1948, as if there is nothing else to this incredibly long, complex, tortured hatred than what's been happening for the last 70 years in a small country in the Middle East. And what that is, is a reduction. It's racist in itself, because it's a reduction of Jewish identity to something that they can, those people can take a very easy binary position on. And so my position in the book is, is to take, is the chapter about Israel is very small, And it doesn't really go deeply into Israel, partly because I'm trying to do something mimetic, which is to say, you know what, this book about Jews, it's really not about Israel. It's really not a big deal. And I personally don't feel any deep connection with Israel. Uh, I, I am not, you know, I, I think you can perceive all sorts of anti-Semitism now, particularly, and in the way that what Israel does is diffused amongst the West and the way that particularly progressives react to it. So I can talk about that. But in terms of like the notion that I as a Jew primarily have some deep umbilical connection to Israel, it's simply not true for me. It's not true. And I think that what the Jews are expected to be like that is itself racist. Mas, de qualquer modo, falando em Israel e agora com a guerra em curso, é, mesmo eu concordo absolutamente com você que isso se tornou uma maneira de permitir um discurso antissemita que, por razões políticas, de inserção social, não estava, não, não se sentia à vontade para ganhar os jornais, as redes sociais, da maneira como tem colocado. Coloca a todos nós, eu acho que de alguma maneira, a todos os judeus, com maior ou menor empatia ou nenhuma com Israel, coloca o judeu diaspórico numa situação de vulnerabilidade que eu diria que é extrema. É, o 
o antissemitismo definitivamente saiu do armário. Né? Virou tendência. Né? Assim, pode ser antissemita à vontade. Você, diante do momento que nós estamos vivendo, que acho que construiu uma situação muito eh, particular, você escreveria um novo capítulo sobre isso numa possível nova edição do seu livro? Sobre essa guerra yeah. e o tipo de estratégia que ela permitiu? Well, I should. I should write a new book. I was thinking about writing a book called Jews Still Don't Count. Um, uh, but, and, and actually, my publishers would absolutely fucking love that. Uh, they would love me to do that. Uh, I might do that. I, I mean, this is, this is not, uh, this is just me and not really to do with the situation. But I, I don't want to to just talk about juice. Um, I mean, this book has been very important to me. You know, it said something that I, I really felt needed to be saying, something very deep about my own being, and it's resonated. And I'm very, very grateful for that. It's very resonated with Jews, and I get letters and uh, messages the whole time from Jews, also many from anti-Semites, by the way, uh, but uh, <laughs> telling me I should die. But that the messages from Jews are almost universally, incredibly... What they tend to say, which I like, is that a lot of Jews were feeling this, but it wasn't articulated. Sarah Silverman, in the film, in the documentary you referred to, the comedian Sarah Silverman says it was like something in the air, and you made it tangible. Uh, you articulated it. And I'm very glad that I did that even though it's a bad thing that I've had to articulate but I'm glad I've given a voice to people in, in that way in my own life I don't know that I want to just talk about Jews uh, in Britain now uh, I have become you know I was well known before but I am now very very like thought of as, as the Jewish person and at the moment I get asked all the time to go and speak on TV about what's happening. And actually, that's part of the problem is I don't want to talk about the Middle East. You know, people are going to... If I go on a show in Britain now as a representative of the Jewish community, next thing I know, someone's going to say to me, well, do you think there should be a two-state solution? I'm like, I don't fucking know. I don't know the answer to deep, complicated geopolitical questions. This is a book that deconstructs the anti-Semitic mindset. I know that. I don't know how to sort out an intractable conflict 4,000 miles away, right? So... My answer is, I think I, it would be good for me to write that. I don't know that I want to. My second book is about atheism. I want to write a book about maleness. That's what I want my third book to be about. But my publisher would say, well, write Jews still don't count, and then write the book about maleness. Okay. <laughs> By the way, I will, I will get into more trouble for the book about maleness. Definitely. One of the things, I just say this, right? So the book about maleness is like, uh, it's not a defense of, but it's a sort of a, a way of trying to own having a male gaze. I'm trying to own it. It's never owned, having a male gaze, right? And what I think is that I wrote this book and I got a lot of hate and a lot of anger from people, but Jews were very grateful. If I write a book about men, I will get a lot of hate and men won't be grateful. Men, men will just be cross with me for writing a book about men. So I perhaps shouldn't do it. I don't know. Por que que não... Por que que eles não gostariam... Por que eles não reagiriam? Wouldn't be that honest about being male. That's what they'll say. I, I, that was, that's what will happen. Don't tell them. Is what, is what they'll say. Porque as mulheres, porque as mulheres em contraposição têm é, uma série de livros sobre mulheres. Né? Yeah, no, that's. Sobre... <laughs> so we're talking about this now, uh, rather than the Jews. This is. I didn't really didn't think I'd get into this conversation, but that's almost the point. Is that I, I have read almost every important feminist text over the of the last sort of 60 or 70 years. I've read them all, and I, and I mainly agree with all of them. I agree with all of them. But what I the only thing I don't agree with is there's no male reaction or answer to any of this, and they are about men. They're about men as much as they're about women, right? Feminist yeah, writing yeah, about is about gender. how women are mistreated by men. And so you would have thought at some point there might be a male voice in that, but there isn't. There's literally, no, except idiots like Andrew Tate and <laughs> terrible people like that. So that's my point, is perhaps there could be a different no, voice. No, it was very interesting. 
É, mas, enfim, que já chegaram perguntas aqui, mas nesse mesmo trecho em que você fala de Israel e esse, essa passagem antológica que eles não podem ser eles não podem ser judeus, afinal, é, você faz um apanhado das suas referências é, judaicas, grande parte dessas referências são humoristas. Né? E, salvo engano meu, todos são estadunidenses. Né? Mas o seu humor, para quem lê o livro sabe, e quem está aqui também, é tipicamente britânico, isso é um elogio. É, eu não seria eu sem o Monty I'm not sure why. <risos> eu não seria eu sem o Monty Python. Ah, okay. Não seria eu, seria yeah. outra pessoa. É, mas também na, durante a leitura, que muitas vezes me perguntando se é possível comparar, se existe uma coisa que a gente pode chamar de humor judaico, se existir, se ele é comparável com o humor israelense, me pergunto também se existe um humor israelense. Então, sinta-se à vontade yeah. para comentar. The only Israeli humor I've seen is Adam Sandler's film The Zohan, which I don't think is actually Israeli. Um, I mean, actually, I tell a lie. There's probably quite a lot of Israeli humor, uh, but I don't know. I mean, I... So, one of the things, actually... Uh, so, I think all the, the books I write at the moment, they come from stand-up comedy, which is what I do in my sort of my day job uh, and uh, even when I'm dealing with very complicated ideas I tend to talk about them like I'm talking to an audience and that's one reason why I think this book has been successful because it takes very complicated ideas but it talks about them in a vernacular way so in terms of comedy uh, one of the things I think is I've had to look at myself and think about some of the jokes that I've made in the past I don't know whether these jokes will work with a, a, a Brazilian audience though because I, I can try them let's see uh, so I used to do a joke uh, and I don't do this joke anymore about a friend of mine who is a real friend of mine who is half Jewish and half Buddhist and I said uh, a Jewish Buddhist that's someone who believes you should renounce all your material possessions but still keep the receipts <laughs> See, it's a good joke, right? And it gets a big laugh, but I had to stop doing it because I thought, now I'm a Jewish activist, that's a joke, that's sort of a, about a stereotype, right? So instead, I, I was on a show once where they talked about Jewish comedy and the other two people, this was a while ago, it was on BBC Radio, the other two people were not Jewish and at the end of the conversation, they were comedians, but they were not Jewish. Uh, we, they, uh, the three of us were asked for our favorite Jewish joke and I noticed that the other two people just did jokes about Jews and money. And at that point, it was a small epiphany again, a bit like the football one. I thought, actually, why, am I, why are we letting this happen, that all the jokes about Jews are about money? So I told a different joke, uh, this joke. Uh, I don't know if this will work, but I'll give it a go. Uh, there's an Englishman, a Frenchman, it could be anyone, but a Frenchman and a Jew on a park bench. And the Englishman says, I'm so tired and thirsty, I must have beer. And the Frenchman says, I'm so tired and thirsty, I must have wine. And the Jew says, I'm so tired and thirsty, I must have diabetes. Right? <laughs> and the reason I told that joke is it's funny, but also, in my opinion, it's not malign. Because Jews, being hypochondriacs, no one is going to burn any Jew's house down because they go to the doctor a bit too much, right? So, and I think it's okay to be funny about Jews that, in ways that don't lead to hatred, right? And you can even go as far, this is a great joke, this is not my joke, Uh, but this is a great joke. It's an old Russian joke. You can make jokes about uh, about Jews and money if they're about how people imagine Jews and money. In other, in other words, you can make jokes about anti-Semitism. That doesn't make it an anti-Semitic joke. So the example I would give is this old Russian joke, which some of you may have heard. Uh, let's say, let's call them Moses and Abraham. That's not Russian names, but I can't think of Russian names. Moses and Abraham are walking through Moscow. And they're both poor, and they're both suffering, uh, and they see a church. And outside the church, there's a sign, and it says, convert to Christianity, we'll give you 30 rubles. And uh, Moses says, you know what, things are really bad, I'm going to do it, I'm just going to do it. And Abraham says, okay, I can't, but you go ahead. So Moses goes into the church, and Abraham waits outside. And then Moses comes out after an hour, And he says, Abraham says to him, so, did you get your 30 rubles? 
And Moses says, money, it's everything to you people. <laughs> and I love that joke. I love that joke. I think that joke's really a great joke because it says it's funny, but it also says how quickly people will turn to the mob once they feel safe. You know, once they feel essentially white, is what I'm saying. So comedy remains incredibly important to me, but I have started to think more about, well, is this joke okay? What is this joke saying? All the rest of it. I have a series of questions to the public. So I will start to direct them. A primeira pergunta é se você acha que o seu livro é lido pelas pessoas que deveriam ler este livro. Um, Não só os judeus leem yeah. seu livro. Uh, well, so the the sort of sucker, if I can, you, you know, the solidarity that Jews feel as a result of reading the book, that is important, okay? Uh, and I think that's helpful. It is not the target of the book, that's right. The target of the book is kind of white progressives, I guess. The people who are very concerned with the notion of allyship, right? Because there are obviously, white progressives are very keen to show black allyship, to show LGBTQ allyship. You don't hear about Jewish allies quite so much. And that's those are the targets of the book. Now, I don't know how many of them have read it, but quite a few have, I think, and occasionally, I get a very powerful response. So one man wrote to me on social media and said that he called himself out. That's the point, is he said, I read your book, I've always thought of myself completely as a non-racist, but I realized that some of these assumptions about Jews and stereotypes about Jews, I, ha I held them myself. And now I realize, and this was a good phrase, he said, I realize that anti-Semitism is the racism that sneaks past you. And I think that's very true. I think that's one of the problems with trying to call out anti-Semitism. It's more elusive sometimes and more diffuse than other types of discrimination. And to some extent, the book is a primer to make people realize that. I will say just one other thing, which is, um, I would say one thing in the book, I mentioned this very briefly earlier, uh, which I think was on the nursery slopes of what I was talking about. I thought this is like obvious, uh, anti-Semitism is racism, right? And should be treated like racism. But the way I point this out, uh, hit home in such an extraordinary way with so many people when they wrote to me that I realized this is not obvious. And this is the point. I say anti-Semitism is not ra religious intolerance. And I'm, I can prove, I can prove it's not religious intolerance. I am an atheist, but the Gestapo would kill me on sight. In fact, my great uncle Arno, would died in the Warsaw Ghetto. He was a secular Jew. And I can promise you the white supremacists marching in Charlottesville and chanting, the Jew will not replace us, they would not ask me if I kept kosher before setting light to my house. People, racists do not care about what you're saying or not saying in synagogue. They just know you're a Jew and that's an uh, inalienable state of being as far as they're concerned and that's why it's racism. And the reason I bring that up is that would be the thing that most people who have read the book have said, oh, I never thought about it like that. E uma outra pergunta que chegou aqui do público é o quanto é importante também diferenciar a luta contra o antissemitismo da luta contra o racismo, contra os negros, já que há, as discriminações contra os negros geram uma desigualdade que hoje o antissemitismo não gera mais. Os negros não estão em uma situação mais vulnerável do que os judeus? Então, so, it's not in my I'm not interested in trying to create a kind of league table of racisms or grievances or whatever. That's not the point, although a lot of people th seem to think it is. I'm more interested in saying uh, that and trying to delineate how the racism against Jews work. Uh, and that delineation and that 
specificity has been left off the table. In fact, there's a version of that, I would say, which is similar like when Black Lives Matter happened, uh, right-wing people would often try and say all lives matter. And that, I always felt, that's an obvious right-wing way of trying to make it not a problem, of trying to take away from the specifics of the way that, say, my niece, who is mixed race, might have to put up with certain types of racism that are not. All people do not have to put up with. But similarly, you see that on the left. And you see it on the left with people saying anti-Semitism and all forms of racism. You see that all the time, particularly at the moment. People will talk about uh, anti-Semitism and they'll have to mention Islamophobia and they'll have to mention other types of racism. It's very, very rare that any kind of progressive person, politician or whatever, will just focus on anti-Semitism and give it the space that you can say, okay, this is a very particular type of racism. It's a very particular type of discrimination. It is not the same as other types of racism. That doesn't mean it is any better or more important or should should be given any more space, but it should be given some space. So, and one of those things in which is like this notion of like, so the people do have some idea, I think, this kind of strong idea of Jewish privilege. And within that notion of Jewish privilege, that seems to sort of take away any sense of vulnerability because it's as if like, all that matters in our culture is a sort of like a idea of structural inequality. But that leaves something out, which is violence, right? Violence, hate crime against Jews is like hugely, hugely on the up. So let's say, let's imagine for a minute, and by the way, I don't think this is a statistic that is actually correct, but let's imagine for a minute that Jews are okay into economically. Right? Let's imagine that's the thing. And so therefore people think, okay, that's fine then. They're clearly not as important in terms of the concern of other minorities who are not okay economically. That's fine to say that, except there is another part of racism which has happened to Jews over and over and over again, which is it doesn't matter how secure they might feel within a culture, that culture, and I feel it is happening now, will start to say, they are too privileged, they are too powerful, they are too comfortable, and now we must take their, all that away from them. Now we must burn their houses down. I'm not saying that's definitely happening now and that would be hysterical to say it, but history teaches us that it happens over and over again. De uma certa forma, é, pelo menos num país como o Brasil, é, daria para fazer uma analogia entre antissemitismo e islamofobia até porque aqui a comunidade árabe e a comunidade judaica têm histórias muito próximas, cronológicas, eh, motivações, e é muito curioso como eh, esse tipo de racismo ele é tratado de forma velada, como uma como uma questão à parte. Sim, isso é só para endossar o quanto é perturbador. Né? Sem levar, deixar de levar em conta que, o que a questão colocou, que no Brasil tem um contexto é, racista, racializado, muito brutal. Sim, são centenas de milhares né, de jovens negros que morrem nas periferias brasileiras. E isso, de fato, não acontece conosco, comigo, né? é, muito embora nunca tenha me sentido tão vulnerável, inclusive fisicamente, como nesses últimos dois meses de guerra. Mas eu vou passar aqui para uma pergunta do público, que é o que importa. É, alguém aqui lançou a questão que foi revelado que o movimento Black, Black Lives Matter comemorou os ataques do dia 7 de outubro. Como você vê movimentos como os antes, como esse tipo de movimento que é antirracista agindo dessa forma? Deixando claro que se não sei o quanto eu pessoalmente não sei o quanto o movimento Black Lives Matter comemorou, mas houve é inegável comemorações no mundo inteiro né, sobre os ataques do 7 de outubro. E, nesse sentido, como você vê movimentos antirracistas agindo dessa forma? 
Um, well, uh, as far as I know, that was one thing on Chicago BLM's uh, Twitter feed rather than a sort of general statement from Black Lives Matter, as far as I know. But, I mean, in general, I would say that um, what we see at the moment is a result of uh, a very simple binary, which sort of Philippe talked about earlier. So uh, it, it seems to be the case... Um, I can quote someone. So Jonathan Safran Fur, the writer, uh, is in my documentary. And he says that um, if you see the world, which I think has happened more and more and more, and social media is very part responsible for that, if you see the world as just about the victimizers and the victimized, and there's no greater complexity to your worldview than there are victimizers and the victimized, then it's very hard for people to imagine that Jews are the victimized. It's extraordinary in a way that it is hard, given that we are, you know, really historically one of the most persecuted minorities ever. Nonetheless, even as I say it myself, I think it seems to be complex or sort of cognitively dissonant to imagine that Jews are the victimized in that binary. And the story that we continually tell ourselves is... Uh, one in which we imagine that good and evil exists in the world. Again, it doesn't really. It's much more complicated than that. And within that, there is also underdogs and uh, people who are, you know, making the world of the underdog world. There are, there are conquestors and conquested and all the rest of it. Jews are a glitch in that matrix. Jews are a big glitch in the binary of oppressor and oppressed. Uh, and because Jews are, have an incredible history of persecution. And people are frustrated, I think. I sometimes get this sense that one of the things that I get when I talk about you know, the need to understand these things with greater complexity because of Jewish history is a kind of irritation. There's a kind of irritation with the idea that people cannot or should not easily imagine that there is only good and evil in this, and we know who the villains and the heroes are. And that seems to be what happens when the people who most performatively, which are people often on social media, but also maybe people whose identity is very caught up with an idea of what anti-racism is, when they see a conflict like in Israel, they, they think, well, it harbors me to have any complexity here. I just, you know, to go back to what I said earlier, 1,300 people, I just read it before I came on, 1,300 people, mainly artists, signed that letter in Britain and America, lots of people I know, saying that Palestinian voices were being suppressed in art, mainly in art, in exhibitions and all the rest of it. And by the way, I'm not saying they aren't. I'm not saying that Palestinian voices, certainly I, I would agree with the fact that we are not hearing enough from those voices. That would absolutely be true. But the minute you move to suppression, and the minute you move to A. Y. Way's example, that the mode of that suppression is via some notion, some imagined notion of Jewish money and power owning everything that leads to that suppression, then you're in a Nazi space. That's where you are. And yet all those people are very right-minded people, very concerned very wanting to help the world, will sign it without thinking. É, os, e uma outra pergunta do público, e acho que dá sequência a essa sua, a sua discussão. Os judeus parecem estar cada vez mais aderindo aos partidos conservadores e de direita. Isso não significa que os judeus de fato aumentaram o seu poder ou que isso tem a ver com o fato dos ou isso tem a ver com o fato dos judeus terem sido abandonados pelos progressistas. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, certainly in Britain, um, there's been a rise in Jews supporting the Conservative Party than there had been. Jews were naturally uh, very much socialists, and uh, I came from a very socialist background. My dad was a stood very badly and lost very badly for the Labour Party. Um, and I, I went to 
a, a Jewish youth movement called Habonim when I was young. And a Habonim, there's a few people from Habonim here. How amazing. Uh, uh, I went really because I wanted to get off with girls. But I... Uh, I, that was a socialist Zionist organization, right? It seems almost, I mean, it still exists, but for a lot of progressives, that would seem to be impossible that you would have a socialist. But in the 70s, in the 60s and 70s, as I'm sure you know, and I'm sure some people in here know, Israel, and particularly kibbutz, was very associated with a socialist ideal, a socialist utopia. Uh, and Jews in general, most Jews I knew, ad ad adhere to that idea. Now, it, it would be the case, it would be true now, it would be true of me, that without becoming in any way right-wing, I will never vote for a right-wing party, but I am alienated from the left. I am. I got alienated from the left during the C Corbyn years. And it's less to do with, in a way, sort of extreme anti-Semitism, some of which we, I think we are seeing now, uh, but more to do with a, a sense that these people, this, these parties who say that they care, they so didn't care. At the time of Jeremy Corbyn, it was literally very clear to me that these people, my comrades, they couldn't give a fuck about how Jews felt. Uh, about what was happening and that will create a alienation and it creates a sense of where is my political sanctuary right and it doesn't feel like it's on the left i now think and it's not really helpful in terms of social change but i now think that the way to think about it is like don't think in terms of right and left right and left anyway is incredibly fragmented now it used to be the case that the left was more about the working class and economics, now it's more about identity. And, it, and in identity politics, that's exactly where Jews are a glitch and a problem, right? So the right have weaponized that. The right have definitely weaponized it. But the fact of the right weaponizing anti-Semitism on the left uh, doesn't mean that anti-Semitism on the left doesn't exist, nor does it mean that Jewish people should on the whole flock to the right, although some are doing that. Seguindo aqui com as questões do público, se alguém mais tiver alguma questão, aproveita, porque vai ter pouco tempo daqui a pouco. Hein? Assim como o antissemitismo saiu do armário, você acha que os que não se colocavam como judeus se perceberam judeus? O antissemitismo aumenta a consciência judaica sobre ser judeu? Yes, still don't understand it. Um, uh, uh, I, uh, let me try. try it in English, Giselle. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you think that uh, that anti-Semitism became so strong now because uh, now Jews, they are more aware that they are Jews because of the war, because of those all the right. pressure on social media. In this sense, the anti-Semitism increases our uh, so is there a kind Jewish of Jewish awareness. Right. About yes. being Jew. Well, yeah. So, so there's two different things there. So I do think anti-Semitism does increase one's Jewish identity. It does. And some people, like, um, uh, I think uh, we were talking, I met you yesterday, uh, and we were talking about how, I think this museum has uh, somewhere in it, like, different ideas about what a Jew is, and lots of different answers. And that demonstrates the complexity of Jews. But I'm going to say something which some people will find very depressing. I'm just going to say it. If you ask me what a Jew is, it's someone who Hitler would have put on a cattle truck. Jews, have, they have to accept, we have to accept, and by the way, all minorities, I personally think, have this. Whatever positive aspects there are about being in a minority, they're in a dance with persecution, right? Where, you know, there's a type, the blues is sung by black people because it's a cry against persecution and it becomes a thing of celebration. It still a cry, begins as a cry against persecution. And Jewish blues is kind of comedy, I think, right? And that comedy arises from a notion that we are other in one way or another. And that otherness, it can be positive, but it remains in a dance, as I say, with something very terrible and dark. And so I would say I became more Jewish, definitely, as I heard 
anti-Semitism increasing around me. I was always pretty Jewish, right? I was always pretty Jewish. I mean, look at me. I was always pretty Jewish. But nonetheless, I definitely felt it intensify uh, as I became... But then another thing, which may or may not be an answer to your question, but I think is important, which is... So I'm, I, I, put, I, I have a kind of, I don't know, on the spectrum, it may not be on the spectrum, that might be offensive, but anyway, need to say everything that is in my head all the time. Like I, very, I can't control myself, I sort of have no filter, I need to speak in my head all the time. Now that went against something as regards anti-Semitism, in Britain at least. In Britain for years, uh, so I remember someone once saying that the headline in the Jewish Chronicle, which is the newspaper in Britain, the headline in the Jewish Chronicle, in one way or another, was always just, they hate us, right? And I said, no. I said to that person, no. The headline is, they hate us, and let's not make a fuss about it. And that was a very British thing. The British Jewish community were always, let's not make too much of a fuss. It will just increase anti-Semitism. But I can't be like that. I have, I'm like militantly unashamed about being Jewish. I'm militantly unashamed about everything about me. It's a weird genetic thing. But one of those things is being Jewish. I, Jewish shame is very strong. It's, ve it's a very strong and weird thing. And I, can I finish with a story, a funny story about Jewish shame? I don't, are we finishing? Should we finish? Is it time to finish? Yeah, because I, I can answer more no, questions no, if you no, want. Go ahead. It's go time ahead. to finish? Because this is a funny story, and I'd, I'd like to go out with a Please. laugh. I'm a comedian. All right. No, no, oh, no, look, he's giving ahead. you other questions, right? Questions. Okay, so do the questions, and then I'll finish with this no, story. No, tell your story. Okay, I'll tell the bloody I'll story. Do. Okay, so let me tell you a story. It's a football story, actually. So I used to do a show in Britain about football, a comedy show about football. And me and the other guy were being interviewed uh, by a guy in Britain who's a football commentator, or who was a football commentator, called Jim Rosenthal. And Jim Rosenthal, I, I, when I was growing up, I used to think, oh, he's one of very few people on British TV who's Jewish. He wasn't a hero. Uh, he was quite a bad commentator. But nonetheless, I thought, he's Jewish. Great. Anyway, so he's interviewing me and the other guy on comedians on this show. And uh, outside Wembley, where the FA Cup final is about to happen. And it's Saturday. So I did a little joke. I said, should you be working on Shabbos? Right? And he gets really angry. This guy gets really angry and says, right, stop filming. Stop, everyone, stop filming. And announces to the crew and everyone else, I'm not Jewish. I'm not Jewish. I get out of that because of my mum. Right? This belief that some people have. I don't personally have it. Both my parents were Jewish, but my wife is Catholic and my children are Jewish as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, Judaism is passed down through your mother. So he announces it as really embarrassing and awkward. My partner, comedian, was very angry with me because he'd done four jokes that went really well. He had to do them again. It was all really awkward. And then in 2002, I was in Japan for the World Cup. And some of you who have been to Japan will know the hotels often have very big spa areas at the bottom of the hotel. So I went down to the bottom of my hotel in Japan, and there was a sauna, big sauna, and I went in the sauna, and there, naked, was Jim Rosenthal. <laughs> and I tell you what, he fucking is Jewish. <laughs> you see, we're not going to top that, Giselle. I, I said we should go out on that. We're not going to top it. Yep, see? <laughs> there are two more questions. Oh, two more questions. Consider them an encore. Oh, no, they, they love to listen to your uh, answers. Uh, before this, let me just announce, when we terminarmos aqui, eh, os li o David e os livros estarão aqui fora, assim, quem quiser conseguir o autógrafo e ler, né, ter o livro, porque eu falei aqui vários pedaços, mas acho que eu fui a única que li. Então, a não ser as pessoas que já tinham lido em inglês. Né? É, então, feitas as considerações, eu vou aqui para duas perguntas. Uma diz o seguinte, quando nós falamos sobre judeus dentro da comunidade judaica e para fora dela, destacamos o número de prêmios Nobel, a invenção do ICQ, do tomate cereja, além do melhor, essa do tomate cereja eu não sabia. É, espero que não sejam um estrangeiros. Ok, the translation's gone really weird. Uh... Além... The, the guy I just mean, said, I don't know about the cherry wait. tomato, and I don't know what that means. I don't, 
know about the tomatoes. She said that. Okay. So let's. Is it a question on... about groceries? <laughs> we can focus on ICQ and the Nobel okay. prizes, maybe, and, and also, aqui em São Paulo. Uh, também quando falamos sobre os judeus falamos do melhor hospital de São Paulo que uh, a imensa maioria da, da comunidade que paga que trabalha para pagar o aluguel não pode usar sem querer culpar a vítima tema construído também para sermos é, isso, essas características também não contribuem para nós sermos considerados brancos detentores de privilégios? O, não o tomate cereja. O, o, os prêmios Nobel, a invenção do ICQ, é, o melhor hospital de São Paulo, que a maior parte das pessoas que pagam aluguel não pode pagar. Enfim, isso não teria contribuído também para nós sermos considerados brancos detentores de privilégios? Tudo bem, a gente vai incluir o tomate. Okay, so it's still já. quite difficult to understand uh, because there was still stuff about the cherry tomato in the middle of it. Um, yeah, but the cherry tomato, I, that's what he said. Keep it I'll keep it out. Yeah, I, I like them. They're very nice in salads. They're not um, well yeah. are not. But um, so. I think to answer that question, I can't speak about the hospital in São Paulo specifically, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's a thing that is quite complicated within this conversation, which is the actuality of Jewish success, right? So there, it is true. I sort of heard uh, in passing uh, the mention of the Nobel Prize, something like 22% of Nobel Prize winners have been Jewish, whereas 0.05% of the world's population is Jewish. And One of the interesting things about that, and I don't know if I can really answer the question really, but I will just say one thing about it, which is um, I was once asked to do a documentary about that, and it was a Jewish producer, and they said, we want to have a program where a Jew can talk about how incredibly above their weight Jews have punched, how Jews have you know, managed to have this incredible... Uh, yeah, cultural and to some extent economic success. Not always, by the way. That's over thought about. I, I, you know, I'm not a statistician, but the notion of Jewish wealth is incredibly overpriced and also overattached, right? Uh, so in the book, I quote this statistic and I basically just got it off Google because I'm not a statistician, but saying that the in America... Jewish millionaires are X percent and they're vastly outstripped by Hindu millionaires, right? Now, the point about that is really not to say anything about Hindus. It's to say that Hindu millionaireship will not be noticed. Jewish millionaireship will always be noticed. And Jewish producers in Hollywood will always be noticed, right? There's, I, can't, I, do, I constantly get people saying... Jews as well, saying, well, we are overrepresented. Now, what does that mean, overrepresented? Because there are many types of endeavor that certain people might be good at, but it's only Jews where it's constantly pointed out in a malign way that suggests, by the way, that there is something ill-gotten about that success, that Jews might not be just very good at storytelling, which I think Jews actually kind of are for lots of reasons, but that somehow their secret network has propelled them to this power. You know, um, I mean, one of the things I talk about a lot um, is the fact that, you know, authenticity casting in films and TV is very powerful now. And, you know, uh, most minorities, and that's not just ethnic minorities, but LGBTQ or deaf people or whatever, are played on film and TV now by actors who are part of that minority. And there's a sense in which it's disrespectful to do that, except Jews, you know, except Jews across the board. Now, that's interesting, right? So number one, it says something about how people see Jews, as ever, as not requiring of the same respect or whatever. But it says something else, which is Jews apparently are overrepresented in show business. And yet they can't find a fucking Jewish actor to play Oppenheimer. They can't find one. They can't find a Jewish actor in that film to play Einstein. Einstein. The most iconic member, I would say, of our minority, Einstein. Now imagine 
if the most iconic member of another minority was played not by a member of that minority in any film. Right? It would just be immense uproar. Okay, So while I agree with the question that there are some examples of Jewish success and sometimes it's difficult for us to own them because we're so frightened that people are going to say, look, this shows how Jews are in control. Jews have got power. I think we should also say it's generally a myth. You know, it's generally a myth. Jews and Jews are Jews are a mess, right? That's the point. Is I went on a march. So there's been seven or eight marches in London, uh, pro-Palestinian ceasefire now marches. They've been enormously well organised, enormously well attended, and lots and lots of cameras and TV and whatever. There was one march last weekend. And it wasn't even called, a, it was definitely not called a pro-Israel march. It was called a march against anti-Semitism. It was so badly organized. No, no Jew there had any idea where we were going. Oh, we were just wandering around. There was like, we didn't know we were speaking. It was just people having conversations about food. Uh, and at one point I had a 10 minute conversation with my cousin, who I just met there about ulcerative colitis, right? It was, it was the most, but... It was, that's what Jews are. Jews are essentially quite a sort of bumbling minority who most of the time can't organize anything, and yet we th people think we're in control of the world, right? So I think the fact that, that there, are some, there is one hospital that's like a, a rich hospital is not an argument for how Jews actually control the world, is my answer. I totally agree. <laughs> two opinions, two Jews, four opinions. Yeah. Uh, infelizmente, eu vou ter que encerrar aqui esta conversa, mas, repito, os livros e o David estarão aqui no saguão. É, eu agradeço demais a sua generosidade em conversar comigo e conosco. Então, gente, agora é ao livro. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Giselle. Thank you very much. Thank you.